I'm going to start tonight with a small warning. Uh, some of the topics that we're going to discuss tonight are uh, mature. Uh, we're going to be talking about drugs. We're going to be talking about um, prostitution. We're going to be talking about child pornography. We're going to be talking about some topics here tonight that are pretty serious. But in addition to that, we're also going to try to focus on all of the educational stuff and everything else that's going on. But I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that we're going to be discussing a whole slew of topics tonight, OK? Um, so to begin, my name is Aaron Jones. Uh, I'll be lead instructor for the evening. Um, if you would like to know a little bit about me, I have a master's degree in intelligence analysis with a focus in cybersecurity. I have worked at the Chandler Police Department for several years now. Uh, I am a general instructor, so that means that I'm authorized to teach law enforcement about uh, numerous topics, including uh, cybersecurity as well as digital forensics. And in addition to that, I work as a computer programmer here for the police department. So I am a software developer and I do write code. Uh, and in addition to that, I help out with some of the server maintenance and et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. So I have a pretty good background in some of this stuff. In addition to that, I also work at Mesa Community College and I teach some of the classes there, including Linux and cybersecurity. So I want to thank you all for coming. And as you can see up here on the board right now, I have the tour project. Now, most of what we're going to be discussing today is going to be on tour, but there's several other projects that I'm going to touch on, including I2P, GNUnet, uh, Freenet, and I believe that is my uh, entire list there. So this is an introduction to dark markets. And while we are going to be talking about Tor, what I really want to talk to you all about is what's on Tor. What are people using Tor for? What happens when somebody breaks into your computer? What are they going to do with that information? Why do they want access to a database on somebody's server? Why do they want access to your computer that is sitting at your home? What could somebody do with this information that they're able to get? We have four performance objectives for this evening. And so at the conclusion of our course, you as the student will be able to identify three illicit goods sold on the darknet. You will be able to identify what the darknet is. You will be able to identify what the tld.onion is. And you will also be able to identify how to generate a .onion TLD. So like I said, I was showing Tor. And most of us are familiar with Tor, but I'm going to give a small background on it. Uh, there is also I2P. Now, I would like to make it known, I have attempted to experiment with I2P several times, and I have been unable to get it to work. It connects, it populates, it does all of the stuff that it says it's supposed to do, and then I simply cannot connect to anything. So just to put that out there, I have not been able to really work with I2P in any kind of fashion that was functional. In addition to that, we have Freenet, and then of course we have GNUnet. And All of these are methods that you can use to communicate over the internet in either a private or secure manner, or sometimes both. Okay. Now, of course, Tor is our largest network. It's probably the most well known. In general, whenever the public thinks about like the dark net, or they think about cyber criminals or anything like that, in general, people immediately think about Tor. That's the one that's been in the news. It's the one that's been in the media. That's the one that essentially shows up anytime you look online and see people discussing anything having to do with cybercrime. It also has the most number of known users. And of course, it's also super easy and very, very simple to use. It's not difficult to get online, go to the Tor webpage, pick up the browser, and get it up and running on your system extremely quickly. Uh, now, whether or not it's effective after you're up and running depends on the actions taken by you as a user, but you can be on the Tor network very, very quickly. In addition to that, of course, lots of celebrities, 
lots of well-known figures on the Tor network who use Tor. You have Edward Snowden. Everybody knows Edward Snowden. Uh, you have Facebook on Tor now. You have The Intercept, which worked in conjunction with Edward Snowden for getting some of his information out into the world. All well-known users of Tor. Now, I want to make it clear that I personally feel that Tor is a very powerful tool for good. You can use Tor to make yourself anonymous. It allows you to have a voice when perhaps you may not be able to have that voice. It allows you to communicate, talk about things that you might not be able to talk about. Tor is a great tool. It's a fantastic tool. It allows you to do things on the internet that you may not otherwise be able to do, particularly if you come from a foreign country where freedom of speech is not something that they recognize. Whereas here, in general, any one of us can get up and we can voice a political opinion, we can voice some kind of opinion, and in general, we should be protected. There are places where that is not the case. Questioning is potentially tantamount to asking for uh, the death penalty. So, Tor gives people a voice. In addition to that, historically, the way that Tor was developed and designed, it was originally a project created by the Navy. DARPA got involved. They started using this thing to be able to help people in foreign countries either get information out of those countries to us or to be able to communicate within those countries. And then eventually they privatized it. It turned into a project that was a open source project. Several of the original people who worked on it, who were working at the Navy and at DARPA, moved over to this open source project and uh, began to contribute, and it's only grown from there. So it has a very storied history in that originally it was a tool of our government. That's what TOR was, that's where it came from. It was originally designed for individuals working with our government. And then eventually it was released into the public. People jumped on board. People realized that this thing could be used for good. And there are a lot of very good people who are contributing to this project in an attempt to make the world a better place. Now, to the flip side of that, there are individuals out there who are going to abuse this tool like anything else. You can use a firearm to feed your family. You can go hunting or you can use a firearm to commit a crime. Regardless, it's a tool. Tor is a tool. And there's nothing inherently evil or bad about Tor or the internet or computers or anything like that. It's your choice of how you employ that tool. But remember, hacking is a business, OK? So let's keep that in mind. There are very, very few people out there in the world breaking into computers, conducting criminal operations for a Robin Hood mentality. There's something to be earned for those actions, and there are people pursuing a profit from what they are doing. But let's take a step back for a moment. And I want to give you all a very important example that I feel that everybody here should know. Now, I, working in law enforcement, have an opportunity to sit down with a lot of people who, guess what, work in law enforcement. And they have experience with some of these tools. And there's something that bothers me that I have heard repeated. And I want to make sure, because I have heard that thing repeated several times, that you don't hear that same thing in here. And the statement is, Stay away from Tor, because if you use Tor, you'll get hacked. OK? And I disagree with that statement. That's not how Tor works, OK? Pretty much everybody within this room has some kind of familiarity with Linux. I'm going to take a wild guess and say the majority of us are above average computer users. There's not very many people that have decided to spend their Tuesday evening in here who are completely new to computers. Everybody here at least knows the word Tor, or you wouldn't be in here unless you just saw the word Tor and decided you wanted to see what this is all about. But for the most part, everybody in here has some sort of experience. When you are out on the 
regular internet, quote unquote, you do very specific behaviors. You make sure that when you download something, you verify the download. You make sure that you are pr practicing safe internet browsing behavior. Every single action that you take on the regular internet will also help defend you on the Tor network. It's not a, a, it's not a magical place where the rules change. Nothing's flipped upside down. Nobody can just, well, before I say nobody can do something, we'll get further down into the threats, because there are threats that can affect you. But what I want you all to understand is that Tor is just another tool. And you're not going to become a victim of a, a crime or, or hacked simply because you installed this tool and decided that you were going to surf over to Facebook. Your use of Facebook over Tor is going to be the exact same behavior as your use of Facebook. And I know some of you are looking at me like, why would you ever use Facebook over Tor? I, I can see it. Don't worry. We'll get there. <laughs> I, see some, I see some looks out there. Whatever behaviors that you're doing on the internet, they're the exact same thing. So I want to stop that, that, that statement right here. Tor is not the boogeyman. It's not going to get you. It's not waiting for you under your bed or anything like that, OK? And we're going to explore why, but we are going to talk about what it's being used for that is negative. So again, hacking is a business. What are people stealing? They're stealing credit cards. They're stealing banking information. They're stealing uh, access to PAWS, point of sale systems, OK? Uh, they want PayPal accounts. They want Skrill. They want any myriad of banking targets or payments, they want that. Um, PayPal accounts are extremely important. And one of the reasons why PayPal accounts are so important is because of carding and the way that money is laundered over the internet. So these PayPal accounts are traded on the dark web in a manner in which somebody will gain access to these accounts, verify the amount of money within the account, and then they will leave it alone. So even though they have broken into an account and maybe the account says, oh, I've got $5,000. This is a, an account with $5,000 in it. They're not going to immediately remove the money from the account. It's not how that works. Okay? Anybody who does that is generally an amateur because somebody's going to reverse the charge the minute that that comes through. They don't just do that. What they're really looking for oftentimes is somebody who's actually using their account because they're going to try to slip in transactions and move money through that account in order to make that money accessible to themselves. So on my journey through the dark net, in which I went out to gather information for this talk and to find what people are doing and how they're using their accounts, the very first thing that I found on my journey was a carding site where they talk about stealing credit cards, stealing PayPal accounts, who's trading what, who has access to what, and who's moving what amount of money into what account. In addition to that, when they're done with these accounts and they've been quote unquote burned, they'll often sell access to the account as quickly as possible under the promise that potentially you'll receive a $1,500 payout for 500 bucks. You give us $500, we'll give you an account with 1,500 bucks. You can try to clear it out if you want to, but we're done with it. We're going to burn this account. They have very strict um, rules on how they handle these accounts. In addition to that, they're also always looking for individuals who want to make a quick buck. Now, you'll see this exact same scam just on the clear web. Anybody here ever use Craigslist? I'm sure everybody here has been on Craigslist before. And if you've ever been inside the job section of Craigslist, you're going to see something that says, uh, looking for hardworking individual who's willing to, you know, make a lot of money. And as soon as you begin conversation with these individuals, they'll tell you what we're going to do is we're going to cut you a check or we're going to deposit money into your PayPal and you get to keep part of that proceeds and then we're going to send, have you send some of that money on. Or if it's even worse, what they're going to do is they're going to tell you we're going to ship things to your house. You're going to gift wrap them and then you're going to ship those on. Okay? Each one of these being scams that they're using to get you 
to essentially become responsible for the money laundering, for the stolen cash, for whatever it is that they're moving. And then they get products like PlayStation 4s, electronics, stuff that they can sell in their country. And then when the police come knocking, guess whose house they come to? Not that guy's, yours, okay? It's essentially the exact same scam, but done on the dark web. Looking for somebody with a PayPal account who wants to make a quick buck. We're gonna send you $5,000 and we need you to buy some Bitcoins and send those Bitcoins to us and then the rest of the money you can keep and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the day, you find out that you have a huge PayPal bill. And PayPal comes looking for their money. Now, of course, that's why people are selling these accounts. The idea being you buy one of these accounts and then you become part of that and they're moving this money. And mind you, some of these scams that these people are running are making enormous amounts of money. And they have to find a lot of people to be able to help them move that money around where they can't gain access to it. They just can't. There's no way for them to be able to pull the money out without having other people helping them do it. So these logins, these passwords, my first goal was to figure out how all of these things are becoming money for these people. What are they doing? How are they turning what amounts to key logging into a multi-billion dollar industry? And all of it hinges around gaining access to other people's bank accounts and gaining access to ways that they can move that cash around or turn that cash into physical products that they can then sell later. Now, mind you, for a lot of these people, this is a pretty dangerous thing. They're risking jail time. They're risking uh, worse, depending on what country they're in. There are some individuals who can get very upset about these things. So they are very cautious with this. One more thing to add to this, and I, I feel this is an important piece to the puzzle, because your identity is just as important as your bank account. Oftentimes with these scams where they ask you, hey, we're going to send you money, and then you're going to push that money on for us, and then get to keep a, a cut of it. They're also going to ask you, because of course it's a job interview, right? Hey, we need your social. We need your date of birth. We need your driver's license number. We need all of this information and potentially information relevant to, uh, because they do target people who are coming here to the US on, um, who are immigrating here. So they target their immigration papers. They target a lot of stuff. And then when they're done with you and they burn you, then they go and they take your identity and they go sell that too. So not only do you end up with a bill from PayPal, now your identity has been stolen and they're selling your driver's license and your date of birth and all of your other information on the internet as well. Okay, so criminally speaking, they can really clear you out. And I think that that is a, I think that's a major problem that needs to be addressed. And of course, we will address that here shortly. So I want to talk about two people. And the first one is going to be a Secret Service agent, and the next guy is going to be a DEA agent. And I bet you, as I start to discuss these two individuals, everybody here is going to go, oh, yeah, because you all know these people. The first one's going to be Secret Service agent Sean Bridges. And he stole $800,000 worth of Bitcoins from Silk Road 1.0. OK? And if you don't remember Silk Road 1.0, Silk Road 1.0 was when um, Dread Pirate Roberts decided to open up his small online business on the dark web and start selling narcotics. And then he moved on to uh, what he assumed was murder for hire. And these two individuals who were investigating said crime decided that instead of investigating the crime and being successful law enforcement officers, that they would turn to being criminals because it paid more. And like I said, Sean Bridges stole $800,000 worth of Bitcoins back many, many years ago when that was going on. Obviously, Bitcoins are worth a lot more now, which that matters, OK? So this is Sean Bridges. 
Listen to his sentencing. The, George, the judge ordered Bridges to forfeit the following property. Okay, $800,000 back then, he's still in custody right now. Theoretically, he hasn't spent any of this money yet. Okay, so that $800,000 is worth a lot more now. He was ordered to forfeit $165,000 from a brokerage account, $306,000 held in a trust, and $4,000 from a PNC bank account. And then he also agreed to pay $500,000 in, um, in restitution. Okay, sounds like a whole lot of money. But when you consider the fact that his money has essentially doubled, if not tripled by now, and it's waiting for him to pop out of where he's being held, he made a lot of money off of this. His actions are something I, is on a personal level, disagree with highly. Uh, he betrayed a lot of trust. Now, if you didn't know, he was involved in the investigation into Silk Road. He was chosen because he knew how to use Bitcoin. And that was a big deal back then because all of this stuff was very new in law enforcement. Hey, I know how to use the internet. I can click a mouse. I can work with Bitcoin. Put me on the team, coach. And upon joining up and having access to all of this stuff, he built a Bitcoin wallet. Now, I don't know how many people here work with Bitcoin, but if you have access to a Bitcoin wallet, I can give you a copy of that wallet, essentially. I can CP that file and send it over to you, and then you would have access to that wallet as well. But that doesn't mean that my access to the wallet is gone. Now, at the time, it would appear that individuals involved in this case didn't know that because they refer to the wallet as a physical object that they kept in uh, evidence. Like somebody had given them a Bitcoin wallet, and by putting it into evidence, it was secured against somebody else having access to it, even though this other individual was able to copy the file and have access to the file and so on and so forth. Obviously, times are changing. People are becoming more educated about Bitcoin, about Tor, about all of these things. I mean, take a look at all of us. We're all sitting in this room discussing this stuff, right? But at the time, you had an individual who could essentially say, here's the Bitcoin wallet. It's in your hands now. Well, the day that they filed charges against him, he just emptied out the wallet, took all of the money and disappeared with it. Well, attempted to. He filled up a duffel bag with the firearms, body armor. He uh, told his wife to help him. Essentially, from what it looks like, he was going to attempt to get a uh, birth certificate issued that made it look like he was his wife's kid. And then they were going to move somewhere and she was going to like adopt him or something. It was kind of weird the way that he had built this. But I guess the idea was this was an opportunity for them to disappear with money and all the stuff that they want and just go. Obviously that didn't work out. They figured out, grabbed him, and it was over for him. Sort of. So our next guy is Carl Mark Force the Fourth. And I thought that it was interesting that when I was reading about this guy, the news article said that the biggest crime was this guy wasted an awesome action name to become a criminal. So <laughs> Karl Mark Force the Fourth. That guy could have been like the next James Bond. He also pled guilty. And they list him as having stolen seven hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. But my understanding is, having done the research on this, he actually really didn't get very much money out of the whole deal. He attempted to and he attempted to be part of this big criminal conspiracy to snatch up these bitcoins and bounce out of town but it didn't really work out that way however the other thing that this guy decided to do was try to start a movie deal which maybe he was capitalizing on the name for two hundred and forty thousand dollars without the permission of the government which 
they frown upon that, and so he pled guilty. Um, again, from what I've read, he didn't really get away with any money. Now they're saying that he got away with 700,000, and I'm not sure if that's either a typo or if that's involved, if they're taking the money that was attributed to the other gentleman and attributing it to him as well. I'm not sure, but again, this guy tried to make some movie deals, book deals, so on and so forth, and did a whole bunch of silly stuff and got himself busted too. There is, there are no reports that the money was ever recovered, okay? Nobody's talked about that, nobody's discovered, nobody's discovered the money. Uh, nobody has discussed whether or not it was returned. However, Bridges was in possession of offshore banking documentation during his arrest. He was in the process of changing his name, uh, getting a birth certificate. Uh, he was taking a lot of actions to disappear. And even upon his arrest, it does not appear that they were able to recover any of this money. That was the first Silk Road. And of course, we all know, right, after they busted the Silk Road and Ross Albright was given his life sentence with no parole and all of that occurred, from then on, there was never again another Silk Road, right? Until like three weeks later when Silk Road 2.0 came out and they immediately started the business again and immediately within another couple of months, that guy was arrested and now Silk Road 3.0 is out and there's another guy operating a quote unquote Silk Road and so on and so forth. And of course, just like any other criminal enterprise, the minute one of these guys falls, somebody else steps in to try to take over. Now, that's one aspect of this situation that we need to keep in mind. There is so much money, there is so much opportunity and also, in addition to that, there is just so much in the way of bad knowledge about the way any of this stuff works. Some of these people literally thought that they were untouchable. There was a, a guy who, looking at all of this, said, you know what, I'm in the middle of an investigation. All eyes are on me. I'm doing my job. And instead of saying, you know what, somebody can look and see the blockchain somebody can follow what I'm doing, somebody can monitor all of these actions, this guy said, you know what, I'm going to take a chance and try to grab the money and run. And I do think that there is something about Tor and the way that this thing works that you just have people lose their mind over it. And it only gets worse. The further we get into this, the worse and worse it gets. There are more and more people who are getting involved in this stuff and um, I almost hate to say it like this, but really it's almost shooting fish in a barrel. So many people are getting on board the tour train and so many people are jumping into this and they have no idea how it works. They don't know anything about it. They are getting wrapped up in stuff that they don't understand. And sure, tons of people are getting victimized. Tons of people are getting uh, involved in illicit things. So we're going to have a whole bunch of downer stuff today, but eventually we'll have some nicer stuff towards the end, okay? It does have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. But for now, we're going to start with narcotics, murder, identification, and prostitution, all right? So that's where we got it. We got to start at the bottom before we pull ourselves up, okay? Drugs. Drugs are on the internet, Silk Road, all of these, uh, Handsome Market. Handsome Market is currently in like operation, okay? They're another one. Now, some of you are probably thinking to yourselves, how could this possibly work? I'm anonymous, you're anonymous, you're gonna send me money, why don't I just keep the money and run? And guess what? It happens all the time on the dark web. Scams, scams everywhere. Everybody's a scammer. Tons and tons of people are out there scamming people 
all day long, constantly and continuously. And if you go on some of the web forums, even on Reddit, you go to darknet markets and all you see is reports of scams, reports of scammers, who's scamming who, who's setting other people up for a fall, so on and so forth. And this is sort of part and parcel just for Bitcoin itself. Okay? And we've all heard of different Bitcoin markets that have failed. Somebody spins up a Bitcoin market and tells everybody, oh yeah, deposit your money, blah, blah, blah. This is great. And the very first thing you find out within three months is that it was a tremendous Ponzi scheme and people were pumping money into it and they were paying out dividends to people so that they would happily tell everybody, oh yeah, it works. This is great. This is awesome. This is how you make your money. And then as soon as they reached a certain point, they grab the money and run. And that's happened since the start of Bitcoin. That's happening right now. That's a continuous thing. And if you don't understand how Bitcoin works and you don't understand how these markets work, you're going to lose essentially everything. Okay? They, they have no, nobody is on there trying to stop these people from doing this stuff. Which again is why whenever somebody sits down and they say, well, you're going to get hacked. Because it is essentially the wild west of the internet right now. This is where people go and there are no rules, nobody to stop you. There's no way of really being able to tell who is who. But it's also something that will make you wonder, well then how does it work? It's obvious it has to work somewhere. If people are able to use it effectively and people are able to sit down and sign up for one of these accounts, where does it work? Answer to question number one, I believe. People are purchasing narcotics, they're buying guns, they're buying fake identification, they're buying prostitutes, and it's all coming from the comfort of their own home. Okay? Uh, there are a wide array of markets, and they're all catering to a very wide array of interests. And even with the dismantling of the Silk Road, businesses continue to thrive, if not grow. And there are tons and tons of markets growing every single day on the dark market. And sales are continuing to rise the billions of dollars that are being spent in Bitcoin and in other alternative cur currencies on Tor is only going up every single day. Now, this one, like I said, we're going to start with drugs, but really what I want to talk about is fentanyl. And some of you may have heard of fentanyl and some of you may not have. Now, fentanyl is being used right now by a lot of people who are addicted to heroin. They're either using it as something to supplement their heroin use or sometimes as a replacement. Now, having gone to certain um, medical events where I've gotten to see firsthand what fentanyl does to some of these people, there are literally junkies who will hear about somebody being killed by fentanyl and then immediately go try to find the dealer that is selling that batch for access to it because they know it's pure and it's good. These are people who are literally seeking out dealers who have killed a person because they want access to what that person's selling because they know it's that good. Okay? And this is just fentanyl. Okay? This, it gets worse because we can get into car fentanyl which is used on elephants and that's uh, essentially they're working towards turning that into being classified as a chemical weapon because you can take about two grains of that stuff and get it on somebody and it will kill them. And so they want to get that out of the hands of people. But, and I'm sure you can see it from here, I've got a whole bunch of links here. We're gonna get into what a dot onion is and we'll talk about that. I can't access this stuff off of this thing right here. So for some of this stuff, you're just going to have to trust me. And some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, you're just going to have to quote unquote believe me. But you can Google, you can DuckDuckGo, you can do all of that stuff to, to really verify everything that I'm telling you. But for a lot of this stuff, I'm just either A, refuse to put pictures in, or B, I just can't. Okay? But for some of it, I do have links to it that is actually out there onto the dark web so that you can sort of follow along and see. So. Starting back on fentanyl, fentanyl is an opioid, and opioids include codeine, hydrocodeine, morphine, oxycodone, and heroin, okay? And fentanyl is extremely dangerous and is capable of causing an overdose with only a very, very small amount. Now, carfentanil is an analog of fentanyl, but is prescribed to tranquilize elephants. 
And even a small dose can be deadly to someone exposed to it. Now a single kilogram, everybody knows how much a kilogram is, right? That's from the countries where they weigh their money instead of count it. <laughs> Yay, I got some chuckles. So a single kilogram of carfentanil contains enough doses to kill 50 million people. That's not a typo. Okay? So if you administered it to each person individually, if you took just enough to kill each person out of that kilogram, you could kill 50 million people with carfentanil. Okay? Keep that in mind. It's extremely dangerous to human beings, and some are now comparing this narcotic to tools like nerve gas. And it can and possibly will be weaponized. One day we're going to have a situation where somebody's going to use this stuff as a weapon if we don't start fixing what's going on with it. And if you go online to some of these links and you start seeing some of this stuff, there is discussion about that. Okay? There are people sitting down and talking about right now, hey, if I have access to this stuff, how do we turn it into an aerosol? How do we get it on people? How do we use this without killing ourselves until it's too late? All right? So dangerous, right? This is a big deal. Carfentanil overdose is pretty much a guarantee to be fatal. Fentanyl uh, does react to naloxone, and naloxone allows an individual who has uh, overdosed on fentanyl or heroin or any of these other opioids, uh, a chance at survival. Now, they sell naloxone on the dark web as well. If you want a gram of naloxone, it's going to cost you $187.44 paid in Bitcoin. Okay, That's what people are paying for this. If you want a single dose, that's a one, milli, one milliliter injection, and they come in little ampules. They sell them in pairs, paired ampules. That's $22.44. But if you also need an HCI auto injector, the tool to be able to hit somebody with it, that's about 1500 bucks right now because the guy found some off the back of a truck. They're regularly $4,000. Okay. So if that tells you what people are willing to pay for this stuff to save their own lives, well, there it is. And in addition to that, when you go onto these pages and you start looking at some of these products, this is the first thing they start pointing you towards. Okay? They don't sit there and point you directly to the drugs. They say, these are the things that you'll need to bring yourself back when you're done playing with this stuff because you're probably going to get killed. And that's what they're putting straight on the page. Now, I have a small misspelling right there, but that's carfentanil. It's $250 for 100 milligrams. Okay? So for 250 bucks, you have something that they equate to nerve gas. That's, I want that to sink in. I told you, kilogram, just a kilogram of this stuff, 50 million people. 100 milligrams is available off of one of these markets. And now, mind you, is it possible that this could be a scam, absolutely. However, and we'll get into the web of trust and how that works on some of these markets, I only chose people, people on these accounts that had extremely high ratings from other users. So there are people who are buying these things and then coming back and doing a review that says, oh yeah, this, this guy really delivers. He knows what he's doing, okay? Then we go to fentanyl, $150 for 500 milligrams. And then, of course, they have drug testing kits. And the drug testing kits are designed to let you know whether or not it's fentanyl, whether it's heroin, how high quality is it, so on and so forth. They sell everything on these sites. Okay? And it's important for everybody to understand that these are issues that we need to address as a community. Like, this is a big deal. I don't want to be in a movie theater and get sleepy and not wake up because somebody decided to aerosol this stuff and shoot it in through the ducts. And if you don't think that that could happen, take a look at the way that Russia, um, how they have reacted to some of their terrorist attacks. 
There was a Russian terrorist attack that occurred. A bunch of Chechnyans decided that they were going to attack a Russian uh, theater. And so the Russians decided, well, what we'll do is we'll pump gas full of what amounts to fentanyl into the movie theater, and these people will all fall asleep, and then we'll save them. Well, a lot of people died. A lot. Okay? So it's not impossible. If a bunch of people in what amounts to, you know, a Russian special forces team can come up with enough of this stuff and aerosol it quick enough that they can pump this into a theater, somebody with enough time could repeat those actions. Okay? So we as a community have to address drug use. We as a community have to address how we're going to handle this stuff. We as a community have to, and I urge the community to really start learning about this stuff so that they can uh, understand what some of these officers are going through. You know, they're having to issue the lock zone. They're having to send this out because it is such an epidemic and so many people are dying right now and it is so dangerous. And you can go online and go to Google and you can see dogs, puppy dogs, that are used for sniffing drugs that have either A, died or B, almost died because they found fentanyl. You can find report after report of officers interacting with a citizen. That citizen drops and within seconds that officer is having an emergency as well because he interacted with that person. It's dangerous. So that's something that I feel that TOR gives us an opportunity as a community to start thinking about how do we work towards making everything safer for all of us. Okay? Because it shouldn't just be about being scared. Everybody in here is really smart. But it'll be even better when people start putting their minds towards how we can resolve these issues and fix them. So don't just be scared. Think about, like, what do we do? So the next one is, uh, and of course, I have a link here. Heroin epidemic is yielding to a deadlier cousin, fentanyl. I put that up there just so that everybody can see that, yes, it's in the news. There's plenty of links for you to go see. People are discussing it. But uh, where is my, here we go. So this one's kind of tough because there's a whole bunch of stuff involved in this. And I, I'm calling this section Hitman, Not the Game. And there are a lot of rumors online that if you're on tour and you're using tour, you can go find like a red room. Does anybody know what a red room is? No? OK. So the idea behind a red room is, is there's somebody in like a foreign country who has a camera set up and you come in with a whole bunch of other people anonymously into this room and then you can pay money and they like beat somebody who's tied to a chair. And then eventually when the money gets high enough and they've made enough money, they kill this person on camera for you to watch. Okay? Like that's a, a idea slash game that they have and there's always rumors of, oh, where's the red rooms? Who has access to one? Where can we see this? We want access to it, okay? In addition to that, there's this idea that you can jump on tour and you can find contract killers, dangerous people from the Albanian mafia who are just waiting to do your bidding for a few bucks. That's another rumor, okay? Um, more mythical and more use as a tool for scamming people than real, okay? Now let's get real. Are there videos of terrible things happening on the dark web? Yes, there are. I can guarantee it. I can tell you that right now with 100% certainty, there are terrible things happening on the internet even as we speak. However, uh, the likelihood that you're going to be successful in hiring the Basum Albanian Mafia to go out and hire them as contract killers? No. However, 
There are people who believe this stuff. And they believe it so strongly that they want to join up. And they don't want to just join up. They're willing to do whatever it takes to join that group. So I'm going to let you all watch this video for a second. There you go. And I want you to see what's going on here. And the guy's filming some paper. And he just broke the gas tank on a car. And it's all real shaky, of course. And he's having a hell of a time trying to start his lighter with one hand. And of course, he has to show the paper again. And all of this will make sense in a second. Just give it a moment. But that's a car that this guy set on fire. And of course, he has to show the papers again. Now, What's happening in this video? This individual decided to get on tour, and he found a web page where this individual, another guy, was essentially telling everybody, I'm a contract killer. I work for the Albanian mafia, blah, blah, blah. I can go around. I can do all kinds of crazy stuff. But I need somebody from the United States to do killings there. And this guy was so excited about it, he said, I want to join up. How do I sign up? Let me in your club. I want the Dakota ring. And so the dude on the other end of this said, well, you got to steal a car and then show us a picture of you like stealing the car. So the guy went and did it. And so the guy comes back and he says, okay, well, I want you to steal a car and then I want you to make this video where you show me the paper and then you burn the car and then you show me the paper again. And he had detailed instructions on exactly what he had to do behavior wise before he could join the club. And so he went and did it. And at this point, Things get hazy. Uh, the individual who is running that web page says that what he did was he tried to get as much personal information from this guy as he possibly could. And then he went and contacted the FBI and said, hey, there's a crazy dude out there burning cars and stuff. You need to pick that dude up. And they attempted to locate this guy. Now. Whether or not they found him, I'm not sure. I don't know, because there's not a lot, of, a lot of extra information about this. But this guy was so excited about this idea of being able to become some kind of Tornet, Darknet, slash super serial killer, that he was willing to do anything that somebody told him to do on the internet. Whether it was burn cars, do all of this stuff. Um, what I'm going to tell you right now is most of these web pages where they offer you, like, we'll kill somebody for money, I'm going to tell you exactly what happens. Somebody goes to that web page and they say, I want this action taken. And they go, it's going to cost you 500 bitcoins. Here's how to go get your bitcoins. Give us those bitcoins and give us information about your target. And that person goes and gives them the money and then gives them the information. And then this person says, oh, I need more information, and so on and so forth, until they get as much information as they can. And then they go drop it straight in the FBI's lap. And then they walk away with the money. And they turn people over, over and over and over again. In addition to that, the people who are selling drugs are doing the exact same thing as well. There are people who get on here, and they say, oh, I'm selling you know, 10,000 hits of LSD for X amount of money. You send me the money. And maybe they've been selling small amounts to get their likes up. And then somebody comes in for a big order and they turn all that information over to the FBI and say, go get them. And they take their money and they run. And that's happening over and over and over. Now, if you go to this webpage, which is the riskbasedsecurity.com, where they break everything down, they show all of the messages. This guy turned over everything he had. 
every message, every discussion, everything that he had with this guy who wanted to be a contract killer. And then, of course, other people show up, and immediately the scammers run in. And what do they start saying? Hey, guys, guess what? We're real, but the web page got hacked. If you send us money, we can really do it. And so on and so forth and over and over. Because immediately, as soon as somebody saw that somebody was dumb enough to send them money, guess what? Here comes 100 more people saying, no, 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 that guy was fake, but we're real. Send us the money. So again, it's one of the top scams. And it's what people are using to lure folks in to do stupid stuff on tour. Now this next part is tough to discuss. Because there's a lot of stuff, and I've worked in law enforcement for enough years that I've seen some pretty terrible things. And Words can't really describe some of the stuff that's going on out there. Like when I say human trafficking, a lot of times people have this movie idea of what human trafficking is. It's a beautiful young girl and she's put on a boat and sent to another country and she has the wicked stepmother and then one day a nice young man swoops in and saves her and it's all over and then everything goes better. And it's not like that, okay? And I, I don't want to get up here and be like, oh, here's all this horrible stuff and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, everybody go home and be depressed. It's, I don't want it to be like that, but we're going to discuss a whole bunch of this stuff. So human trafficking, the sex trade, and pornography are all powerfully present on the dark net. It's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. If you go get on the hidden wiki right now, which is open to the clear net, the hidden wiki is a... Uh, it amounts to like a Wikipedia site that you can go to to find out about everything that's going on on the dark net. Okay? If you were to go to that right now, all you have to do is control F and think of any sexual term that you can think of and type that in and hit enter and it's going to send you to dark net sites that are focused on that. It's a clearinghouse for all of these dot onion URLs that are supposed to cater to different people. Okay? Drugs and sex are the two easiest vices to find on the internet. And that's not just on Tor. Uh, anybody see this yet? Uh, where is he? There he is. CEO of Backpage.com arrested. And he's now been charged with pimping. Does anybody know what Backpage is? Some of you. Some of you don't. That's OK. For those of you who don't, so there's Craigslist, right? And most of us all know Craigslist. Well, there's Backpage as well. And Backpage is another alternative very similar to Craigslist where you can go on and you can do your very own um, like ads. You can set up your own ad and you can say, I'm selling something. Or I'm doing a thing and everybody's invited. There's a lot of legitimate uses for web pages like that. Just like Craigslist, there's tons of legitimate uses for it. However, Backpage.com had what amounted to an adults only section that was where they sold sex. And not only did they sell sex, they sold sex with children, they sold uh, sex parties, they sold, and there are certain things that consenting adults can do in the bedroom and that's fine, okay? And those situations are not what I'm talking about. When I discuss this stuff, there were very illegal, very terrible things happening on Backpage, on Craigslist, on all of these web pages. And not only that, but the people at Backpage were helping to make it happen. And now these individuals, these investigators, have been able to prove that when somebody would post something that says, like, child sex, when they would post a child sex related post, Somebody from Backpage would go in and edit the post to make it kosher so they didn't have to take it down. They had people reviewing the posts to make sure that they met standards so that they can continue to victimize people. Okay? Now, the guy's going to go to jail for that. And I'm fairly certain that 
there will be more charges forthcoming just from having read what's on there. And I'm okay with that. Good. Now, does that mean it's going to stop Silk Road? No. Uh, has anybody looked at the news lately? They just got another child pornography site that was on Tor, and that one had 87,000 users. 87,000 users, okay? That's a huge number when you think about it, of people that were doing this. Now, I've talked to some of the people that I discuss these crimes with, and I've had a conversation with them. If I say the word playpen, does anybody know what I'm talking about in reference to Tor? No? Okay. So I hope nobody in here thinks that I'm talking bad about law enforcement because it's not like that at all. But this is an, a second situation where somebody in law enforcement did something that I disagree with. And I think that a lot of this has to do with sometimes with as new as this technology is, some people just simply don't understand what it is that they're doing. Okay? So let's keep that in mind because some people just don't. There are people right now that if you told them to go post all their information on Facebook for a job offer, they would go do it because they just don't know. And it happens, okay? So Playpen was a huge bust that happened recently where the FBI was able to locate a Tor hidden service. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. They located this Tor hidden service and then they took over the hidden service. And the hidden service in particular was distributing child pornography. It was distributing uh, chat room messages between people so that they can communicate with each other to schedule when they would go commit abuse and things like that. Okay? It was a very terrible place. Well, when the FBI took it over, they fixed the server, they improved performance. Once they took over, the performance was so much better that more people came to the site to start using it. Okay? Because when the FBI was doing it, instead of just some rando dude, they had the skill set to make that essentially the internet's premier place for child abuse. And then eventually, after running it for a while, even after a judge said don't do it, and even after some lawyers said don't do it, and even after a whole bunch of other people said don't do it, they did it anyways, and they ran it for a while, and then eventually uh, they used a very specific, specially crafted attack to unmask who was involved in the site. Okay? They used an exploit, they attacked the Tor browser itself, because everybody knows it's based on Firefox, right? So I'm just going to tell you right now, even though all the documentation says they refused to reveal what exploit they used, I can tell you with confidence it had to have been a Firefox exploit because there was no other tool they had access to. It's just process of elimination. So they conduct the attack. They make multiple arrests. Some of those people immediately plead guilty and just plead out and they're done. However, some of them said, you guys did wrong, I'm going to fight this. And so they fought. And eventually the court said, you must reveal the attack that you used. How did you get into these people's computers? How did you reveal who they are? And how was this attack conducted? And the FBI said, we're taking all of our toys and all of our balls and we're going home and just let them go. We don't care. And they walked away. And essentially, those individuals got to walk free. If they fought and they went to court over it, they were done. OK? That I have a huge problem with. There is a, there's a term called re-victimization, where a person's been victimized, but then when you record it and you continuously provide it to people, that person is being re-victimized every time. OK? That person is being hurt every time that those images or those videos or anything else is being distributed. 
I have a huge disagreement with somebody continuing to run those services in order to try to catch other people and then at the end of the day to walk away from it. That makes insult to injury. So are people doing this on the clear net? Absolutely. Are people doing it on tour? Obviously. And they're catching them. They're grabbing people. 87,000 people just recently. Okay. Playpen was like in the hundreds of thousands of individual user accounts. Okay. But are more people popping up? Yes. Is this stuff all over the dark net? Yes. Are there people using this as a tool for this stuff? Absolutely. In addition to that, and of course, it only gets worse, people are trafficking in slaves. And some of you are probably looking at me like, so did he say slaves? Is that like a, that's still a thing. So there are web pages on the darknet that you can go to and that people are using right now at this very moment to order human trafficked individuals for like dates to foreign countries. So you go to this web page and you say, you know what, I'm going to be in Britain for a month and I want a 15 year old Romanian girl for 30 days and you pay X amount of money and then that person is given to you. And this is happening all the time. And not only that, we just recently had an individual who was in the news, he was a, an Arabic gentleman who was arrested for trafficking in 14 to 16 year old girls. And I'm sure everybody here knows about all the immigration problems that are happening in Europe. There's different people from different countries who are moving around right now and a lot of these families are being torn apart during the, the moves and the war and everything else that's going on. So you have this situation where you will have a group of young girls who are separated from their family and somebody will swoop in and buy these young ladies and then take them to another country and then ship them all over the European Union for use. And they're, they're doing it to, to young boys as well. I don't want to... It's, it's happening to everybody. It's humans on a whole, okay? Let's keep that in mind. It's humans on a whole. They are taking boys, girls, women, men, people from all parts of the world are being used and forced into human slavery. And of course, there is a strong emphasis on sexual slavery. Some of them, they just make work, but some of them, they're not that lucky. Uh, if you were to look at Tor right now, I can guarantee everybody here with the skill sets that everybody here has, within minutes, everybody could find children as young as eight years old, at least, uh, from different ethnicities, different countries who are being trafficked and who are being put on the internet. Um, are some of those fake? Absolutely. Are all of them? No. The threats, particularly to these sellers, law enforcement, and that's good. Uh, people are using this stuff to do terrible things and law enforcement is waiting for an opportunity to snatch them up. So what does that mean? How are they operating? They're operating off of a web of trust. Now we've talked about the web of trust here before, so if you've ever said in this class, we know what, what a positive tool it can be. The fact that I can trust you and you can trust me and we can discuss and send information to each other and if I want to send somebody some stupid memes, then I can do that and you know those memes came from me. And that's a great fun tool. But for these individuals who are working illicitly, they have to use the web of trust as well. And it, it's no different than one person going to another person and saying, hey, where do you buy your weed? Oh, I get my weed from so-and-so who lives on the east side. Oh, can you drive me over there real quick? Sure. And that's a traditional crime. We have all know about it. We've seen it. It's a thing. One person goes to another person. It's word of mouth, and that's how somebody goes to get their weed. It's the exact same thing online, except now they're trying to put 
a more professional face on it. You go to a web page, you make a purchase, you go in and you leave a review like it's eBay. You can give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, rate one to ten. And they're trying to turn this act of ruining people's lives into something as easy as eBay. Okay? Now, of course, on eBay, if you get a bad review, the SWAT team isn't going to come kick in your door. You're not going to be subject to possibly somebody showing up at your house to do a kidnapping, demand ransom money, and then kill you and leave you in a ditch, generally. Okay? But with these crimes and with the things that people are doing here, the stakes are higher. The importance of that web of trust is much higher. And the behaviors that they're following in order to secure themselves are very different than somebody who maybe sells some cheap Chinese stuff on eBay. Um, but in addition to that, there are people who are gaming the system. You have somebody who will run themselves up hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of positive reviews by making it look like they're doing sales and they're creating this private web of trust which at the end they turn into a theft. People say, oh, this is a person who's doing good business and they start selling more expensive things and eventually they get enough money that they walk away. And entire businesses have built, built on this, okay? This is not just an individual who jumps on Hansonet and goes to Hansa and starts running these cells. These are literally Silk Road 4.5 where they built the entire business under the auspices of eventually we're going to steal from everybody. So how do you get around? How are people finding stuff? Well, there's the hidden wiki, which I discussed, and I have a link to it. And that's one tool available for finding web pages hosted on the dark net. And then, of course, you also have search engines and then URL repositories. Does anybody remember the days of, like, banner trading? Yeah, yes. Somebody got their GeoCity site and you were really pumped because you had Green Day on there and it was time to share it with somebody else. Or whatever, you know. So that's what they're doing. It's the old school method of distributing links to each other, creating that web of trust, even amongst their .onion links, and moving from there. Now there is the Torch search engine, but it is super terabad. It is awful. Um, you can use Torch to help you search for web pages. I tried to use Torch under the this mindset of I'm going to get on Torch and I'm going to find things that are fun. I'm going to look for stupid memes. I'm going to look for cat pictures. I'm going to look for literally anything that a normal human being would want to be able to look at on like a Thursday night. Like I just want fun and I didn't really find any there wasn't fun stuff on there okay but there are also plenty of web pages that we're all familiar with that are on tour 4chan blocks a lot of tour 8chan does not they have their own dot onion okay so some of these anonymous message boards they're hopping on board with Tor. Facebook has a dot onion. They want people to be able to access Facebook within the dot onion ecosystem as opposed to having to hit an exit node. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well right now. I'm just going to kind of interrupt to jump onto why do we have the dot onion TLD? What is that for? That is a generic marker to let you know that the traffic going to that dot onion is staying within the Tor network instead of hitting an exit node. Now if I had a board, I'd try to show you stuff, but um, the way Tor works is you have relay nodes, you have entryways into the, into the Tor network, and then you have exit nodes. If you are running a hidden server, that hidden server is running within Tor. It is accessible from that dot onion link, and it never reaches a, an exit. Now, if you were to hit an exit that is a bad actor, potentially they could use SSL stripping to gain access to your data. So if I were to be within the Tor network, 
and I want to go to Facebook, and I got to log in on Facebook, right? And I have to hit an exit node and go from the exit node out into the Facebook servers. That SSL stripping could potentially be used to gain access to my user credentials, my username, my password, so on and so forth. Okay? If somebody is running a bad actor exit node. However, because all data is encrypted within the Tor network, if I'm moving from one node to another using relays and I don't hit an exit node, people are not going to be able to strip that SSL. They're not going to be able to take some of these actions that they may otherwise be able to take. Therefore, by staying within the Tor network, that increases my security. In addition to that, it increases my security against certain timing attacks. And we'll get into some of those timing attacks here in a little bit as well. Because there's a whole bunch of methods that can be used to unmask a Tor user. And staying within the Tor network protects you against certain attacks, leaves you vulnerable to others. But when you look at the benefits versus the cost of going to an exit node or staying within the Tor network, staying within the Tor network is a, a better choice in the long term. In particular, the more things that are on the Tor network, the better signal to noise ratio. The more people who are using Tor, the better it is for all of us. Tor becomes faster, it becomes more stable, more things are accessible, obviously. But all of those things become normalized where it doesn't become a huge sore thumb that sticks out when somebody looks at your browsing history and sees that you use Tor. Because that's just as effective in tool in terms of finding out whether or not somebody's perhaps talking about the Dalai Lama while in China. I heard that as a really good example. You can't talk about a free Tibet in China. But on tour, potentially, you could. You could discuss whether or not the Dalai Lama is doing something good or bad. You can have a civilized conversation that you may not otherwise be able to have without access to a tool like Tor. So there's a whole bunch of web pages that are moving to having dot onions. In addition, I know, for those of you who don't know, a dot onion is supposed to be a hashed value. So it's supposed to look like a random grouping of characters, uh, 16 characters, followed by a dot onion. However, because some of these companies have extremely powerful computers, they can actually hash repeatedly until they find something that sort of resembles what they want. So like Facebook actually has the word Facebook inside of their dot onion. Uh, Proton Mail has Proton inside of the hash. You can actually see words within the hash. Not everybody's going to have that. Most people are just going to run a random hash and it'll be just a random set of characters. But some of these companies that have very, very strong computers can afford to sit there and hash long enough that they start getting actual pronounceable words within their hash. What about email? Yes, email is available through Tor. In addition to that, there are companies who only do email within Tor. So your email messages could never leave the Tor network. The idea being that if you are doing your email through the Tor network, uh, and they even tell you, make sure you use GPG encryption, encrypt your message, send the message, keep it all within Tor, never allow it out. The idea being, you can go here, you can use this, somebody cannot find these messages, they can't force us to give them up. And if you follow all safety and security, you can deliver text back and forth between people using these services. And in theory, nobody should be able to take that away from you. And a lot of this came after the Snowden stuff. Snowden happened and people started throwing up different email servers. In addition to that, everybody remember Magma? Magma, Lava Bit? Lava. Yeah? Okay. Magma being the tool and then uh, Lava Bit being the company. And what happened to Lava Bit? Somebody stepped in and went, poof, give us all your stuff. And they said, no. And then the judge said, give them all your stuff. And they did. So the idea between, behind these is people should be able to send messages to each other without it being seized, taken, or brought down. And there's a whole bunch of them. Torbox, uh, Anonabox, VF email, SecMail, 
Proton Mail is on there, but they can also send out into the clear net. There's tons. But also they tell you, GPG Encrypt, digitally sign. What do we talk about whenever I have conversations about anything like that? We need not just anonymity, but you also need to be able to prove who you are. So I tell you, be ready to be able to GPG sign. Be ready to be able to GPG encrypt. Be able to do whatever it takes so that you can use this stuff in a proper and responsible manner, right? You can use Tor to communicate with your friends or family. You can use any of these tools and it's just fine. But because of all the extra stuff that you're dealing with, that means you may need to look at, okay, I'm going to encrypt my message and I'm going to send it. Maybe not even for privacy purposes, but maybe just so that you can prove that this is the message you actually sent. And don't think that any provider of anonymous services is immune from compromise. Again, Tor is not magical. It's not a magical forest where you go into and everybody has magical anonymous powers. It's just another tool and there can always be bad actors. You as a security researcher, because I know some of you in here are security researchers and you're going to use Tor. Why? Because you're going to go to a web forum where people are hacking into computers and you're going to sit there and you're going to read about the next big attack when somebody goes, hey guys, watch this. Anybody who's running Windows Vista version blah, 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 man, they're going to have a surprise in the morning. And people are looking for that. They're paying attention to the conversations that are being had. And if you can speak a foreign language, even better, especially if it's like a European foreign language, because then you get to see what they're doing over there too. So onion routing, dot onions. What is all this? Why onions? What's going on here? Onion routing is a method by which communication over the internet is layered in encryption. The encrypted data is then transmitted through a series of network nodes called onion routers where each layer is peeled away in order to reveal the next destination of the data. And that final layer is decrypted when the message is delivered to the destination. Anonymous travel of the data is made because the intermediary transfer node will only know the location of the node immediately preceding or following it in the node. Does it make sense? As your packets move through the network, it only knows the next person in the network and who gave it to it. It never knows further than that. That's the core way that Tor works. I'm going to send information from server to server, but I only know who I am, who the next server is, and who the server was that handed me this data and nobody else. And so nobody can follow those packets through the network. And of course, I do another breakdown of U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, DARPA, so on and so forth, and eventually financial support from the EFF made Tor into what it is now today. <clears throat> so what's an onion? What are we really looking at here? Well, onion is a special use top level domain. What does that mean? If you are not connected to Tor, you cannot connect to a dot onion. They will not route it through the internet. It is protected. Okay? Nobody can go and register a dot onion address and set it up so that somebody from the clear net can hit that. They just can't. The, there was decisions made and eventually they said, you know what, dot onion is important enough that we should not make this a method of attack of allowing people to register a dot onion on the clear net and then have the same dot onion connected over Tor and then allow people to do collisions and that puts users in danger. So they said, no more. So generally, a dot .onion address cannot have a word in it. But again, exceptions to that rule. And due to the ability to strip SSL from sites going out through an exit node, it can provide additional security for a site being accessed inside the Tor network to also provide HTTPS. You can see that. Facebook has a SSL certificate for their dot .onion. DigiCert issued that, okay? And I believe Let's Encrypt can also issue for .onion. And so you can still, even with encryption provided by Tor, you can add SSL on top of that. 
and you can use that for essentially marking that this data is mine and it's true and reliable and so on and so forth. If your web page, think of it this way, if your web page is SSL encrypted and then one day somebody comes to visit and it's not SSL encrypted anymore, it's like a canary. It lets somebody know that potentially something's been tampered with. <coughs> there are tools like Shallot, Scallion, and Echelot, and they can all be used to generate the hash to provide a customized Onion URL. You got a big enough computer and you got the, the server power, you can use some of these tools available off of GitHub to try to find a username for your .onion site, the, your TLD. You can get that address to possibly be a word. You can look for words and try to hash for that word. But how do I get an onion? Well, it's easy. If you go to the Tor webpage, they have a setup. It's super simple. And you can put a whole bunch of different stuff behind Tor, and they discuss that. And I'm going to leave it at that because that is a, that's a talk all on its own. There are so many things that you have to do to verify and protect your Tor and Onion site that I just simply can't talk about all of it right now. There's way too much to cover for it to be one item. But what about weaknesses, right? How are they hitting this stuff? Where is this stuff occurring? Well, the first one is timing analysis. HTTPS might obfuscate the data when it's transferred. Tor is supposed to protect you, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And it attempts to obfuscate the connections. However, you can still use logs to figure out who somebody is. If I'm on a web page, and I download 12 megabytes worth of data, and my ISP sees that 12, 12 megabytes worth of data and says, this person was on tour, they moved 12 megabytes worth of data. And then somebody sitting at the server says, at this time and date, 12 megabytes of data were transferred out of this server. You could demonstrate that at this time and date, 12 megabytes, at this time of date, 12 megabytes, they were the exact same. And even if we don't have this inner information right here, we can come to a conclusion that they are probably linked. And of course, there is additional information that may build on top of that. And there will be more that goes along with it, but it's all available there. You may have sufficient proof to imply that a user obfuscating their transfers is one and the same. And that's also important for people who are located in a foreign country where that is very important. If they're trying to get through the Great Firewall of China and their traffic is being monitored and it shows up as, yes, they're using Tor and they have access to additional information, all of that can still be used. So even if your data is not there, it may be enough to get you physically harmed or so on and so forth, whatever goes along with it. Um, some of that is defeated with the use of garlic routing, which is a variant on onion routing where multiple messages are all pinned together in order to make it more difficult for an attacker to analyze traffic and reveal that a specific user is linked to specific traffic. If the server's sending out 60 megabytes or 120 megabytes, but you're pulling down 30, 10, whatever, there, there's a disparity there therefore making it more difficult to pinpoint between the two. Now, garlic routing is used by the I2P protocol, and it's very efficient in bundling the reply block of traffic with the original messages that are going out. Um, again, I couldn't get it to work. So, now the exit node, again, possible avenue of attack. A compromised exit node is able to monitor and acquire all data being transmitted and they could use the exit node to capture usernames, passwords, and other private data. And this vulnerability is mitigated with the use of HTTPS or SSL. And we have to remember that Tor is not a replacement for end-to-end -end encryption, but is a supplement. You don't want to just connect to an HTTP site through Tor, hit an exit node, and then have that information going in and out where somebody is just monitoring it right at the exit node. Okay? Layers. And I've talked about security by layers before. 
in pretty much every single conversation we hear, have here, what does those layers consist of? Well, first we're going to install a product like Tor, but we're going to do it using Docker, or we're going to run it using FireJail, or we're going to use supplemental software to make sure that it's more secure for us. And then we're going to make sure that we connect uh, through an alternative method, so on and so forth. There's all kinds of different layers that go along with it. And of course, it only applies depending on your specific situation. Some of you in here may be having a conversation with somebody from China or Russia or from somewhere else where it's important that somebody there doesn't find out that this person is talking to you. And if that's the case, it could cause you or that other person harm. I'm not here to judge your use. You know, that's not the point of this. The point of this is so that people understand what other people are using it for. They can identify some of the warning signs that might be going on if you're seeing certain actions or behavior on your networks or anything like that. And if you need to step in or have contact law enforcement so they step in, I want you all to understand how this stuff works. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But the largest threat to the Tor user is the Tor browser itself. Okay, your client machine and how you're accessing Tor is your biggest weakness. Anybody here using Windows? And you don't have to be embarrassed, nobody's gonna jump you. A few of you, a couple of Windows users. I know that's not true in the back, that's okay though. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, your choice of operating system potentially is another method of identification depending on how you're using these tools. When I tell you, you can use Tor, you can use a VPN, you can use all of these things, but then you come back and you say, well, I also use Windows 10. And then I have to come forward and say, well, do you understand that Cortana is recording the room while you're using it? The Windows 10 is sending information about your computer back to a command and control center somewhere. All of the information about what applications you're running are made available somewhere. There's a lot going on in the background while you use Windows that really takes whatever it is that you're doing to try to defend yourself and sort of pushes that off where it no longer really works the way that you thought it did. And of course, this is the Linux users group, and I'm a Linux person, and I like Linux stuff, but I also have some Mac stuff. But your choice of operating system, your choice of hardware, all of that matters. Uh, Intel, they have installed software for remote access directly inside of the chip. For a little while here, just recently, Windows 10, if you had Windows 10 installed and you had a specific Intel chip, anybody who had access to that system over the internet had full access to the entire box. And they had what amounted to total root access to the whole box just on account of the fact that there was a vulnerability within the system that really required a full BIOS refresh. I mean, it was terrible. The, the, the vulnerability that was there was very, very serious. So even if you were using Tor or a VPN or not doing anything with that system that you felt was untoward, that's great, except for the fact that full access to the computer was made available over the internet. Everybody knows how WannaCry and WannaCrypt spread? A simple vulnerability that was hidden for a long time. So. I decided I was interested in doing more with malware analysis. So what did that mean? I needed a Windows computer, so I have a Stream 8. It's a little Windows tablet, so I can send stuff to that box to practice uh, with malware and viruses and breaking into the box and seeing how I can exploit that box. Great, right? I turned that box on two and a half days ago. And it wasn't until 10 o'clock this afternoon, this morning, 10 o'clock this morning, 
that that computer finished updating. Okay? To get all of the updates that that computer needed to work. To, to finally be secure. Because it even says, like, on the front of the screen when it comes up, it says, your machine is needs security updates, blah, blah, blah. You need to update to the newest version of Windows 10, etc., etc. All of this stuff is right there on the screen to warn you and to scare you and to let you know. If I wasn't a computer professional, I would have taken that thing and thrown it through a window. To sit there and have to turn this thing on and then for it to continuously reboot over and over and over and to constantly come up and say, over the entire screen, now downloading new Windows 10 components, but it's cool because you can still use your computer, except your processor is spiked up so high that you can't even hit the minimize button. That's a problem. That's a vulnerability in the system in terms of you as users or you as administrators who help friends and family and people who use maybe a Windows computer because you all here probably use Linux or Mac or something professional level, but your cousin or grandma or whatever doesn't, and that's the person who's going to pick up the phone and call you and say, do I really owe the FBI $500? They're going to come to you first. That system, for it to act like that, it, that's not effective. It just, it's not. But of course, we're spoiled. We have package management. Sudo app get update, sudo app get upgrade, and then just walk away. And when you come back in a few minutes, oh, everything's done. And maybe at the bottom it says, oh, it might be a good idea to restart your computer real quick. But within minutes, I can spin up a box and be effective. But it took nearly three days to get all of the updates done, all of the scanning done, Windows Defender set up, all of this extra stuff, so I could have something that eventually I'm going to break. Let's go over our answers real quick, and then we're going to go over our conclusion, a few final recommendations, and then I'll open up to questions. Narcotics, prostitution, and stolen financial data are just three goods sold on the darknet. Okay? The darknet is a computer network with limited mapping by search engines that requires a specific level of technical skill to access. There's a whole bunch of people who hear the term darknet and they don't like it because it is kind of stupid, but that's, what, that's the term everybody knows. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. The top level domain of .onion is a reserved namespace used for websites located within the Tor routing service. You cannot access Tor.onion sites without being connected to Tor. And somebody cannot register a .onion site unless they're using the Tor protocol. And you can obtain a .onion address by generating the hash yourself. You don't need to pay for it, it doesn't cost money, and it doesn't require you to go to a reseller to acquire that domain. As part of the process of setting up a Tor hidden uh, service, you can gain access to a dot .onion. The darknet is a valuable tool to fight censorship, assemble, and to spread important information. It has a place in the tool chest of any security researcher or individual concerned with freedom of speech. And it cannot be emphasized enough that we should each be contributing as we can to the creation of a decentralized and free internet. Everyone should contribute in some way to improving the internet by providing websites over Tor, relay nodes, or even exit nodes if they are of sufficient skill to do so. This is your call to action right here do something. Everybody here has a certain level of skill. Everybody here has capabilities. The only thing I can urge you is to start paying attention to what's going on around you. Pay attention to the community. Pay attention to what you can contribute to. Everybody here has these skills and you're even in this room learning more stuff. But you can continue to make the world a better place. You can work with law enforcement. If you see weird stuff, going on, even in your neighborhood, you know, they, they come out and they tell you, 
If you are in a hotel room, there are applications that you can use. Some of you travel the world. There's applications you can use to take pictures of that hotel room that are then provided to law enforcement. And we can talk about it here in a minute, okay? That are effective. They're actually used to send pictures to those members of the community so that they can take a look at a, a video of abuse or human trafficking and then compare to those pictures that you took and say, okay, we've got a match between this hotel room and what's going on in this video. And it's something that simple. Something as simple as walking into your hotel room and flipping some pictures. And I know a whole bunch of us in here travel, okay? A whole bunch of us go places, we go to different hotels, we have a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing that's part of who we are. It's one more way that you can contribute. My big thing here is to build bonds with the community. I want a stronger community. I want people to understand more about what's going on with computers and to have a better grasp of what's really happening in the world because without it, people become complacent and they don't care and when it's most important, they won't be there. And so I want everybody here to know and understand this stuff. You have to be able to thrive using these tools and understanding what's going on for you as a security researcher because I don't want somebody to make a mistake and get swept up in investigation or otherwise get into trouble or get attacked or anything like that. I don't want that for anybody in here. But what I do want for everybody here is for the ability to do good. Do good things. That's all I want. So my final recommendations. Learn about Tor, I2P. Heck, if somebody can get I2P to work and then tell me how to get it to work, I would love that. I'd really appreciate it. There's FreeNet, GNUNet, RTFM, okay? Tons of stuff out there. Use Linux, all right? Do not bear back the dark net. Docker or FireJail is appropriate, all right? Don't be connecting to the dark net and just running a copy of, of uh, Tor. FireJail, Tor. Run it inside of Docker. I'll tell you right now though, and I have a pull request in, and I, I'm, I'm having a discussion with them, the Docker image that has been created that works with Tor, updating to the latest version of Tor, breaks that Docker image, it constantly crashes. So there are problems with Docker, that's why I'm saying, if you're going to do any kind of security research or anything like that, fire jail it. Throw it into a jail and make sure that you still have some kind of level of protection between you and the application because the application is the weakest link. Fire jail? Yeah, fire jail is an awesome tool, super cool. If you can, run a Tor node, a relay, or an exit node as appropriate and stay out of trouble. Tor is not a magic spell, it's just a tool. Yes? Well, has there been some cases where they've tried to go after people for just running? The nodes and the relays? They don't go after them for the relays. What they go after them for is the exit node, and that's why I always list the exit node as appropriate or if your skill level it allows. Because, yes, there is a risk with an exit node. If you have an exit node, you are the IP address that is going to show up when somebody is doing something bad. If somebody drops out of the Tor network to go to the free net, they're going to come out of that exit node, which potentially you are running and they are going to come knocking at your house or wherever it is that you're running this exit node from. Now, mind you, there are service providers that understand and know what an exit node is. So there are places that you can go to and say, hey, uh, give, me the, give me the price for an exit node. And they will say, okay, it's an additional $2 or whatever. And they will create all of the documentation necessary that you can pass off to somebody. So if the FBI comes knocking and says, why is this exit node? or what is going on with this IP address, they can then go, this is an exit node for the Tor network, and this individual is not doing a bad thing, but potentially, here's all the information that you need to investigate that bad thing. Here's everything that we have. So that's why I always preface that with, if you're gonna run an exit node, make sure that your skill level is high enough and you know what you're doing. A relay essentially is within the network and nobody can see what happens on that relay. And so there, I have no known, um, no known examples of somebody being either sued, arrested, or investigated for a relay node. But for an exit node, there are examples of those online. 
And then, of course, we have the glossary down at the bottom. But let's go ahead and if anybody has any questions, let me know. I'll repeat the question and then I'll try to answer it. Yes? But it's still working. If you're running a relay node, your IP can still be identified in a relay node. You may have problems if you're doing it out of your house. Yes. With service providers, Netflix, Hulu, refusing to give you service at your IP address for right a relay node. So the, the statement was, if you're running a relay node, potentially that'll sh still show up through your ISP, and then people will identify that relay node and then remove services from you or now allow you to have access to those services. Absolutely true, but again, that's why I, if, if you want my personal opinion, it's always better to go with some kind of service provider like a VPS and then make sure that it's not on your network, it's not your IP address, technically, and it is off of somebody else's stuff, and they know what you're doing so that at the end of the day, they're there to provide paperwork and documentation and to demonstrate exactly what it is that you're doing. There's, there's safety in not having that exit node run out of your house when somebody comes knocking, looking for who's doing that. Next. I explained it that good. Okay. I'm not familiar with fire jail. What is that? Sure. So fire jail, and I will... I will actually pull it up right here. Let's do that. Fire Jail is an awesome, I guess, product, but it's a security sandbox. And uh, what it does is, are you familiar with jails in Linux? So Fire Jail is a, just a way of creating a jail. And um, have you ever dealt with uh, like App Armor? Okay, so you can essentially create a profile for a product like uh, Tor, uh, the, the Tor browser. So you have a profile and then that profile is designed to act as all of the configuration that you need to build a jail for the Tor browser to keep it from affecting any other part of your operating system if it were to be compromised, just like a jail is supposed to do. So using Fire Jail, you can run like Firefox, or you can run transmission or VLC. Anybody remember when VLC was sort of a, a pathogen for infecting your computer? Yeah, some of you, some of you not. If you were running Fire Jail and had Fire Jail for VLC, then whenever VLC, when they made that attempt on that attack on VLC, your computer would have been essentially safe from that because it would try to write to the computer and it wouldn't be able to do so because it only has enough access to that box. And when VLC turns off, that box is destroyed. So it's just one more way of putting another additional layer of protection between you and whatever's going on in the outside world. So you can run Fire Jail on something like VLC or Firefox or uh, essentially any other product that you have. You can either run Fire Jail on Nginx. So if you're running a web server and you're running Nginx, there is a profile for Firefox, or I'm sorry, there's a profile for Fire Jail for Nginx that jails Nginx. And then if somebody were to conduct an attack on Nginx, Nginx wouldn't be able to write outside of wherever it was. So it's a really neat. It's a super neat tool and it's super powerful. Uh, I still like the idea behind Docker and using Docker to keep some of that stuff, but also Docker does have its own number of vulnerabilities you have to worry about. So it's up to you to decide. One last thing because I'm sure somebody's going to ask about it. Tails, you can run something like Tails as well. Tails is an amnesic incognito live system. You run it on a USB disk. Yes? I just have something to add on. OK, go ahead. It has a system dependency and a new version of Tails will be released shortly called Heads uh, that, that, won't, that won't have any system dependencies. And, um, in the last like, six months, several uh, so, so, semi-serious vulnerabilities Connected to the system, have uh, shown tail to be actually insecure. Oh, okay. At least in, at least in some, uh, in a lot of things, I, 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 you know, anything with system D is kind of protected. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, if anybody knows me, I don't like system D, so there you have it. Uh, this is a safe place for not liking system D. Go ahead. What's up? So, um, quick little comment, I guess, regarding the Playpen project, which is such a fun topic to talk about. The what project? Playpen. Oh, okay, yeah, Playpen. Yes. Wonderful. Um, um, 
but in uh, to defend slightly uh, the FBI's uh, stance on it, I think they had something that they really couldn't give up, and so they were pretty much stuck between a rock and a hard place. Either they gave it up and then could never use it in future cases, or they'd walk away. And so, given that, what would you do? Because what they had, they most likely could never get again. Absolutely. Okay, so there's a whole bunch to this, but the, the, the statement was, playpen, defense of FBI is, they had access to a vulnerability. Like I said, I believe it was a vulnerability within Tor because it was a vulnerability within Firefox. Okay, that's my guess. And then the question was presented, what would you do if you had a one-time use magic bullet for being able to get into a bunch of Tor related computers or potentially even Firefox. You know, any computer running to Firefox could potentially be vulnerable to this. What would you do? Now, my, my continued stance and my stance will always be I am against re-victimization. I would, and I can play armchair quarterback all day, but I'm not going to sit here and say that it's okay for somebody to host pornographic pictures of a victim online regardless of the greater good or not. If you've got five guys and you're saying, well, I want to just bust one more, you take what you have and you walk. Uh, now, I wasn't there, and I wasn't part of it, and I can't tell you what kind of politics were involved or who had stepped in or what kind of vulnerability was available. I don't have any of that information, and I can't tell you with any kind of certainty, and it's all just personal opinion, but I do believe that if you had that tool and you cannot give up that tool, it would be better to take down that site, take whoever it is that you have access to, and end it at that, than it would be to continue to victimize and re-victimize, and then to, at the end of the day, still walk away with nothing. So that's my opinion. And I, what does it mean, nothing? But there you have it. That's your answer. Uh, I was just going to add, it could have been an intelligence-based operation that's still ongoing. Absolutely. So the individuals that were caught in the dragnet could potentially still be being watched. Yeah, absolutely. For a later conviction of a later crime. They could, and the, the comment was made that it could have been intelligence or somebody could have been continuing to watch the situation or anything like that, and that's absolutely true. I mean, there, there could be any number of events going on right now that is happening, but with the information provided to me and the question given to me, that would be my answer. So, yes. I have like a really technical question. Uh, so, when a when a user downloads the Tor browser, let's say they you know they fire it up, they get online. Uh, I assume that comes with a list of known uh, exit nodes, right? So, because otherwise, how does it know where to connect to? When it when, okay, so my understanding is, is when you fire up the, the Tor browser, okay, it's going to attempt to connect to the Tor network, and it has that initial list of servers that it's trying to connect to, and then from there it begins to populate with data, and it starts building a map of all of the other computers that are connected to that network, and then essentially the protocol itself handles the communication of, okay, I have this initial list of three servers or whatever that I have access to and then once I start connecting out it goes and does the hops and continues to build that list. Now going off of that something to keep in mind is uh, rumor has it that many of the exit nodes are run by government agencies so keep that in mind. Uh, many, many of the exit nodes are run by government agencies. And then in addition to that, uh, a major vulnerability within the protocol would be if somebody was running enough relays and exit nodes all at the same time, all by themselves, they could potentially run enough systems and monitor the hops that they could start identifying every user on the network. Now, the idea is, is this, if somebody was doing that, you would be able to tell because they'd have to spin up a massive number of servers all at once and all have access to those servers all at once. So people theoretically would notice that. But again, let me ask you something. How many here, how many people here have read every line of code in the Linux kernel? 
Anybody want to raise their hand on that one? Because I haven't. So how many, how many people are potentially watching for those vulnerabilities? So, so, so that's one of the purposes of, of the tour project, is to provide those initial entry points along with the client, right? Right. So after that point, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine how, how do they prevent like routing loops if, if every relay node only knows its neighbor? It seems like that's a real. It's going to be a disaster for a network. Right? They don't all just know their neighbor, but they only know the tr they they each relay node knows all of the other computers on the 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 network. The only time that it knows the preceding and following server is during transfer of data. So if you're transferring data, that's when it knows that. But the the relay knows all the other computers on the network because it has that exact same list that you have local to your box. So there's a directory. When you spin up a relay node or join the network, there's a directory of everything yes. that's on the network. But when you send a connection out, it basically builds a multi-layer encrypted transmission that each node that you get sent to is going to up the next layer of headers. It's kind of an analogy. It's like building a, a phone book. Everybody's got the phone book. And as you communicate off of that phone book, that is completely separate to the actual transfer of data. So thank you all. Thank you all very, very much for coming out. I really appreciate it. I hope this was helpful. Yeah.